Um, my name is Kelly Garland. I'm an assistant director of admission at uh, Merrimack College, um, and I do a little bit of our domestic recruitment, but I also do a little bit of our international recruitment. So I work with all of our students coming from Mexico, Canada, and all the countries um, in Europe. Um, a little bit about me, I'm very familiar with education uh, USA. Um, when I finished uh, my university studies um, in 2016, I actually was a Fulbright English um, teaching assistant in the Czech Republic. So Poland, you were my neighbor for an entire year. Um, so it really is um, fantastic um, to be speaking with all of you today. Um, Gail, I don't know if you wanna do a little introduction um, as well now before we kind of get things started. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Gail Pasillo, and I graduated college a lot longer ago than a lot of these people, but um, I came into this uh, uh, program, this new program that we'll talk about briefly. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very young program. It's only a few years old, but it's because of a need that we saw in students. So I'm excited to share uh, with you my background and also what we have to offer. And, uh, and to educate you on that a little bit more. Um, and not a problem about my last name, it's Italian. So in English, it's Basillo, in Italian, it's Piccillo. <laughs> <laughs> right, awesome. So it sounds like some of you are still in your secondary school or high school. Maybe some of you are finishing, um, maybe coming um, over to the US or starting to explore options. Um, being undeclared is definitely something that we talk about a lot here um, in the United States with our high school students. Um, sometimes there is definitely a lot of pressure to know exactly what you want to do and what you want to be growing up. Um, I think when I was 18 years old and you told me that, you know, almost a decade later, I would be working in international admission. I don't know if I would have said that's exactly where I thought I was going to land. Um, and the things that I studied would actually get me there. Um, but there's definitely some people who know, you know, from two years old, I want to be a doctor, probably will study biology or some type of medicine at university um, to get me to that goal. So we're going to talk a little bit today about what it exactly means to be an undeclared student in the United States. Um, if that's perhaps an option at some of the universities that you're looking for, perhaps um, it might be a little bit more competitive to get into certain areas. Um, and Gail, who I'm so happy um, is here to join us today. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Discover program, which is something we have specifically at Merrimack to really help students who aren't exactly sure what they want to study or perhaps what they want to do career-wise, um, especially when they first come to Merrimack's campus. Um, so talk about different support systems as well. Um, so this is kind of what we'll be going through today, a little bit about what it means to be undeclared um, and the application process um, in the U.S. Then I'm going to turn things over to Gail to really talk um, at length about what we're doing specifically at Merrimack to help this student population of students who are undeclared or undecided. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, COVID-19. Um, unfortunately, it definitely seems like it's going to be um, sticking around for um, quite a while if you're looking at how things are going in the United States. It's a very big topic and conversation of how universities will responding um, to this fall. Um, and then we'll have some questions and answers um, to make sure that you leave here feeling like you have some more answers or perhaps maybe you'll leave with some more questions, which we're absolutely happy to chat with you about. So the first thing um, that I do want to let you know is that it's absolutely totally normal in the United States um, to not know exactly what you want to study. Um, and we also have students who come into university in the United States thinking that perhaps they wanna be an English major, start taking courses and then realize this isn't for me, this isn't what I want to study. So we have about 70%, 75% of students in the United States change their mind at least once um, while they're studying um, at the undergraduate level um, in the US. And about half of the students in the U.S. actually come into U.S. institutions not knowing what they want to study. So this is definitely completely normal. I know sometimes there is pressure from families or friends to know exactly what you want to study. Um, but here in the U.S., it definitely is um, a very common 
feeling um, among a lot of our students um, here. And specifically at Merrimack, um, last year we welcomed in a class of about um, 1,100 students. And out of that, about 140 students um, were undeclared liberal arts. So part of our Discover program, which we'll talk a little bit about. So it's about 13% of our incoming class doesn't know exactly what they want to study. Um, so it actually ends up being one of the largest majors in our school of liberal arts. So I think the big things um, to really take away um, is that if you're unsure what you want to study, um, you really should talk to every single school that you are interested in. Um, sometimes the larger um, university systems in the United States, you'll have the university, but within the university, you'll have the School of Engineering or the School of Business. And while you're applying to schools in the US, you actually might need to decide what area of study you want to enter into. Um, it really depends from school to school. Um, some schools, it's very difficult to come in as an education major and realize after your first year, actually want to be a business major. Sometimes it's really hard to switch into the school of business, for example, or maybe switch into the school of engineering. It's very important to have those conversations with each individual school. But for other schools, for example, such as Merrimack, um, you have up to two years to really decide what you want to major in. Um, and there really isn't too much restriction moving from one area of study to a completely different one. Um, and I think that's a theme a lot you probably hear um, when you're speaking with your Education USA advisors in your home countries, um, that every school is unique and every school has different policies um, and different parts of the application. So it's really important to do your research, but I think it is important to know that you do have that option of exploring, figuring things out, um, but it is important to get those answers before you apply. I think it's also important to ask what resources are available if you do come in undecided or undeclared. Um, do you really have two years to decide exactly what you want to major in? Is there a support program or an academic um, counselor that you can talk to about your different options? It's, I think Gail will go into a little bit more in depth of you know, how exactly do you decide what major you want to do? And I think it's really individual for a lot of folks. Perhaps um, maybe you really value money, income, job security. Maybe that will kind of determine what area you want to study, um, what career goals that you have. Maybe it's a passion of yours. Maybe you really love music and that's where you find your happy place and you want to explore that option. Um, there's definitely tons of different pathways, different things that you can study um, in the US. And a lot of institutions do have advisors for you when you do come to help you have these conversations, whether they're career advisors, academic advisors, um, faculty advisors. There is really a lot of people to talk to, have support um, while you're trying to make these decisions um, that will kind of affect different career outcomes and things of that nature. And I'm going to turn things over um, to Gail, who's gonna talk a little bit more about what we're doing with our students to help them find exactly what major they want to declare um, at Merrimack, and hopefully you can use some of those tools and tips um, as you're going through the application process, and even if you decide to come um, to the US as an undeclared student, um, use it at your, the respective universities that you will hopefully be attending. Um, but a little bit about Merrimack. Um, we are located in North Andover, Massachusetts. You might be wondering, where is that? Um, we're about a 30 minute drive north of the city of Boston. So we are a suburban campus. Um, we have about 3,800 undergraduate students, um, and they come from about 31 different states, about 32 different countries from around the world. So even though we are a smaller to medium-sized campus, we definitely have a lot of people from different areas um, across the US as well as across um, the world. 
We have about 100 different majors to choose from. So if you really don't know what you want to do, um, there's definitely a lot of options and opportunities for you to explore. Um, so it really just kind of gives you a very brief overview of the type of institution um, that we are. But I am now going to turn over to Gail, who is going to be our expert in talking about all things about what is this Discover program I keep referencing. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, yes, the Discover program, obviously the name says it for itself. You're discovering your options, <laughs> an exploratory process. So um, at Merrimack College, we call undeclared students undeclared liberal arts. That's not to confuse you. Um, it's just how our, our label is at our college. But each school usually has some sort of undeclared or undecided um, for their title. Uh, if you have no idea what to do. And each school has its own, like Kelly was saying, some schools might have pre-majors or something along those lines. But what we have at Merrimack College is specifically this program that's put in place to support you as you explore your options. So um, if you want to just go to the next slide. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about me, um, I was undecided in undergrad and back then there's definitely no programs for that. Um, so I sort of just picked a major my third year, my junior year, and I was an English major. And I didn't know what to do with it. And I ended up writing for a newspaper for a couple of years and realized maybe that's not for me. Um, and I noticed people telling me their problems. So I thought I'll be a counselor or a psychotherapist. Um, and um, what I ended up doing was specializing in college students. Yay! So I specialized between the ages of 18 and 23. You heard developmental years. So, um, but that's not actually what I did. I, I just mentioned about the windsurfing that I lived in Maui. I was a semi-pro beach volleyball player. So I lived in Hawaii and I just, you know, played volleyball. Um, and then I oversaw a residential intensive program where I worked with um, teenagers that had drug addiction problems. It took me a while to get back into the college scene. And then when I worked in the college, I worked with transfer students first. Then I did that for five years. Then I worked 10 years in athletics. So I worked with student athletes. Um, and then I was in North Carolina and I oversaw all these health programs like nursing, exercise science. And so I've gotten familiar with all different majors, business, everything across the world. And Merrimack College reached out to me and said, hey, we got a new program we think you'd be interested in. Some of the people knew me already. And when I heard, I was like, perfect. My whole life was a zigzag journey. And so it's, it's a perfect fit. So if you don't mind going to the next slide. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, so what are the objectives of our program? One is to reduce your anxiety. The worst is when you have no idea what you want to major in and people are coming up to you asking you, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to study? And you don't have that answer. Um, and sometimes we feel pressure. Sometimes everybody else around us seems to know, but we don't know. Um, but actually, as Kelly was pointing out in the statistics in the United States, that a big, big chunk of students come in thinking they know, but they end up switching their majors. For example, I had um, about 140 freshmen come in this year undecided. By the end of the first semester, 54 had had a sense of what they wanted to major in after we talked and explored. And so they declared the major, but 33 students switched to undecided from their major. So you can see how it's a very transitional kind of thing where some people thought they knew, but now they realize, oh, maybe I don't know. Uh, the next part of our program is to listen. And that's part of my therapy background, right? Um, I'm there to listen, to really hear you. And I'll go over that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, another one is to build relationships with other students who are undeclared. So you don't feel so isolated and alone in this process. We have cohorted classes that I'll talk about and how you can actually build a community within the undeclared students. Um, and we're here to identify your strengths, what you perceive as your challenges and your passions in life. I'm also here to help you identify resources on campus. And resources include things like the writing center, the tutoring center. Um, we have what's called the academic success center and all of these different areas of, to support you on your academic journey. Then we develop a two-year plan 
with a plan to graduate in four years. So most colleges, if not almost all, have something called the liberal education requirement or a general education requirement. You might see this more and more often. And these are courses that are required of all majors across campus that give people a well-rounded education. And they usually make up about two years. And then there's two years of your major that's intensified. So that's why college is four years. It's this nice fit in. Well, this two-year plan that we're talking about, why people take a longer time when they switch majors around is because they find themselves wasting the time taking classes that aren't going to count. The goal of me is to make sure that the courses that you're going to explore in that two years before you actually necessarily have to declare your major, although you can always declare it before, is to make sure it's double dip. So it's going to count in the general education requirement, the liberal arts education requirement, and explore your major options so that you're not wasting your time. So it's like I'm a puzzle master. I'm here to try and help you figure it out so that you don't waste your time and you can finish in four years. Kelly, next slide. Thanks. Okay, so let's talk about what we got going on. So the program, I talked about the special cohorts in the fall. Basically what the cohorts are is there's two classes that are required of the gen ed requirement that you would be put in. And that would be based on your interest. So let's say you said you were interested in psychology. For example, psychology is cohorted with English, which is a requirement of the college for this fall. All the students in the psychology class are the same students in your English class, for the good or for the bad, right? Hopefully you'll get along with them. And that way you start to see each other as familiar faces and you start to study a little bit more together. Um, and then we have the advising session and this is one-on-one -on -one, and I'll talk about the people to the right, uh, but that would be meeting with me and my grad fellow especially. Um, where we'll meet one-on-one, -on -one. this is to get to know you and I'll talk about that a little bit more, what's gonna happen in these advising sessions. So part of it is to get to know you. The other part is to pick classes for you, well, with you. So what's on your interest and so forth. What can we explore? So Merrimack College is designed in what's called a four credit format. A lot of colleges are three credit, meaning that they require you to have five classes a semester to finish in four years. Merrimack requires you to have four classes a semester to finish in four years. And what Merrimack does as well is they don't make their majors 60 credits, meaning two years solid. What they'll do is they'll put it around 40 to 45 credits, which gives you an opportunity to either double major or you can add a minor. And that gives us a chance to explore a little bit more. Um, then I have workshops and programs for you. So in-person workshops, I had like drop-in study sessions with professors. Sometimes it's intimidating to go see the professor one-on-one. -on -one. So what I did was I had the professor come to me. I have a nice little lounge area. And then I had students pop in and, and I had donuts and, you know, cider because it was autumn and, you know, apple cider um, is that beautiful season for apples in the fall. And the idea of making it a relaxed environment where you can talk to your professors and ask questions that you need, whether it's regards to your papers or the upcoming exam or so forth. And other programs, like I literally had therapy dogs come in and everybody's just petting these dogs, a bunch of dogs. Let's just say I had a vacuum a lot when I was done. Those dogs shed it. But the whole point is, is that I try and create an environment where it's fun to get together, but also there'll be academics. Now, um, with this, pandemic of how to get a little bit creative. Um, so for example, I did a 30 day challenge with my students and um, I'm a yoga instructor. And so I'm a retired volleyball player now. So I'm a yoga instructor now. And so um, I did different exercise videos for challenges, as well as different mental things that everybody could do every day. Um, we put together a playlist that everybody was listening to different kinds of music now during this period when you're What's helping you through this time? Um, we put that together. I did an online yoga class with them. So we zoomed in all this stuff so that we could all do the yoga class together. We did a um, uh, quiz, you know, um, a fun little like uh, game show kind of thing. So I'm trying to always think of ways to bring you all together while still being there. And then I'm thinking of ways that should we be online in the fall? of doing the study sessions together and so forth. So I'm always thinking of creative ways and I'm also open to ideas as well. 
So the people that are involved, the Discover program coordinators, me, um, there's Discover faculty. So one of the things to keep in mind is I'm not, just because it's undeclared liberal arts doesn't mean it's just a school of arts. So as Kelly was mentioning, within colleges or universities, there's usually different schools. And liberal arts is one at Merrimack. There's the school of business, education, health and sciences, and um, health science, and then um, science and engineering. Um, and so all of these different schools I'm connected to. So I'm trying to make sure that if there's a course reserved, let's say for a health science major, I'll contact the advisors or the Discover faculty and ask them, can the student please take this course? And usually they say yes, because Merrimack isn't so enormous that you get lost in the shuffle, that I actually can make the phone call and build those connections with them. And then let's say you're really interested in a particular major. I can have you sit down with a Discover faculty representative so they can talk to you more about the major and the different careers that they see people going into. I have a Discover advisor grad fellow and I have a great one. She was actually working with AmeriCorps this year. Um, and then I have a career advisor. So the career advisor, you might think that you can't do an internship when you're undeclared, but absolutely you can. We can start to explore the different careers that are available to you so that you can decide yes or no. And then finally, that academic success center is there's different programs within it to support you along your academic journey. Thanks, Kelly. Cool. So this one-on-one -on -one advising meeting, this is the part of getting to know you specifically. So I, I told you there'll be the aspect of the meetings that will pick courses, but this one is a four-step developmental model. One is for to identify your strengths, challenges, and fears. So, you know, it doesn't matter what I see in strengths in you or what anybody else, it's how you see your strengths in you. So this is getting to understand how you see your strengths, how you see your challenges, and what fears you might have collected. Maybe you really feel like, you know, everybody is telling you, you've got to do this. Or maybe you're afraid you're not going to make enough money from the career interest that you're you really are interested in. So we want to take a look at all that, like what's blocking you from moving forward. Um, also want to see if your strengths can overcome your challenges within the confining environment. For example, if I were playing basketball and I was going to try and dunk a basketball, can I? The answer is no. Now, if I had a ladder, can I dunk a basketball? Yes, I can. Can I use a ladder in a game? No, I can't. So I want to see if your strengths can overcome your challenges within the confines of the environment. If it can't, then we might have to look up other ways to help you get to those destinations, those career destinations you want. The second one is filtering out advice. Everybody knows what you would be great at, right? Let's say you said, uh, your, I don't know, parents said, you are so good with kids, you should be a teacher. But let's say quietly inside yourself, you can't stand children. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't be a teacher. So this filtering advice means I don't want to dismiss the advice. It's probably great advice. They see strengths in you, but we want to see if it resonates with you. The next one is alleviating self-doubt. So let's say we start to really think about, yes, I want to major in communications. And then you have somebody, what I call the accidental naysayers, say to you, what are you going to do with that? And then you start to be doubtful. What we're going to do is make sure you can answer that accidental naysayer and say, I can do this, 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 this. Now, you might not know what career you might do yet, but you can tell them what they do. And we can start to set you up with internships to see if they, these are different career interests that you are interested in. And the final part of that is motivating and empowering you. So I am definitely here to push you forward, to keep you going, and to keep you empowered. Now, there's a kinesthetic approach, the more tactile approach. We have a program called Burning Glass. And what this does is it looks at different careers that you might be interested in, and it looks at the skill sets that you need for the career. So not only the courses that we'll need to take, what major, but actually what skills you need to have, which sometimes college courses don't capture. That's usually something that's learned in internships or on the job. So we want to see what the skill sets are, and then we use what's called LinkedIn Learning. And that actually offers different videos that go over those kind of skill sets. So you can start to watch videos, we can explore that. And if you're like, gee, I don't want to do that, then we know that's not for you. Or maybe it does interest you. 
then the best part is with LinkedIn Learning, they put a little badge on that you've completed the program. And that's great for employers to see that, you know what, you've actually studied, you went beyond your college education and you studied this skill set so that you could do that job. Thank you. So here's the discovered cohorts for the fall. Like I said, this psychology and the writing are together and both fulfill general education requirements. The next set is history and philosophy. And the next set is politics and world religion. All of those are set together. The last one is the first year experience course. Every freshman is required to take a first year experience course. And I have a special topics course. Why do you do what you do? Getting a better understanding of yourself. So it's like, how do you see what confidence is? What does success look like to you? Is it money or is it meaning and happiness? What is all of these aspects? What's self-esteem? How does that look for you? You know, what does your future look like? Do you want a big house? Personally, I want one of those tiny houses. You know, so the idea of what it looks like for you and having an understanding, because if you don't have an understanding of yourself, you're always going to be making decisions based on what other people say for you rather than what you say for you. So that course is all about empowering you. Great. So that is the Discover program. It's constantly growing. It's organic. We're always changing. Um, it's gotten way bigger. It began piloted in 2017 to 2018, and I came in fall of 2018. So um, I've been here for almost two years, and that is my information. If you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And even if you just sort of lost with the whole process, reach out to me. I'll help you out. Yeah. Awesome. So we're going to talk a little bit, um, and like a lot of what Gail said, obviously this is a program that we have at Merrimack, but I think a lot of what Gail kind of talked about with her steps of looking at your strengths and your challenges, what other people are saying to you or people are saying that make you doubt yourself, am I really good at this? Um, that's all different techniques that you can bring um, to any college or any university that you're hoping um, to study in order to figure out exactly what you are interested um, in pursuing, in studying, doing for a career. Um, and of course, there'll be different um, models, different people um, that you can reach out to at those universities um, to help and guide you to finding exactly what that career path is. I think one of the great things that um, you also will have at your um, disposal as international students is that there'll be an international student support office at the university that you go to. I know Gail referenced that a lot of our students will do an internship to see if they really want to enter a certain career field, if that's best for them. Um, a lot of times there's concerns with international students that they aren't able to do an internship. It's really important to communicate with the international student support or student services office um, at your university um, to apply, if we call it CPT, it's curricular practical training. So it's basically that internship for credit that you would be able to do to satisfy um, educational goals, a part of your major, um, things of that nature, um, which is an option for our international students to still be able to get that experience um, off campus, out of the environment. Um, and again, you'll just have to work um, closely with them to make sure you have the correct paperwork um, and things of that nature. Um, before we open it up to questions, um, I definitely think we should talk a little bit about um, the COVID-19 impact. Um, here in the U.S., um, nearly every single college and university has gone to what we say is remote learning or learning online um, for the rest of the academic year. Um, Merrimack as well is one of them. We have been doing remote learning. Um, Gail, correct me if I'm wrong, about seven or eight weeks now since about right. mid late mid -March. March. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've all been working from home, um, doing what we can um, to stay healthy um, and make sure our neighbors, friends and family are staying healthy too. Um, but I think the great thing is, is that like Gail said, she's still connecting with her students for Discover doing different um, activities, putting together playlists, listening to musical together or doing yoga together. Um, it's important to know that 
all of our faculty and support services such as tutoring were all still available um, online and all the colleges in the US are looking to figure out what fall will look like. Uh, the United States, as you know, is a very big country. Um, for us on the East Coast, sometimes it's about almost the same amount of time to fly from New York to the United Kingdom as it is to fly New York to California. It's about six hours or so. Um, so it is a very big country. Um, so the, every single state um, and area is feeling different impacts of um, COVID-19 um, at different times too. Um, so definitely important to kind of see what every single institution um, across the country um, is doing. I think for a lot of schools, they won't decide exactly what they're doing for the fall until a little bit later in the summer. I think every single university really wants to come back for the fall, um, be on campus, be physically there, but doing it in a safe way. That might mean we're going to be wearing face masks, um, having less students in a class together, maybe also offering students who um, feel uncomfortable or maybe are immunocompromised and are more likely to get sick before a vaccine comes out, maybe they have the option of going online. Um, again, every school is looking at many, many different options. Um, if you're hoping to come to the U.S. this fall, um, definitely work very closely with those schools. Um, I know for some, maybe the embassies aren't open yet, so you might be having some questions about how do I get my F1 student visa to come over to the United States? Um, know that all of our offices are monitoring the situation closely and a lot of schools are being very flexible with our admitted um, international students. We're giving ours a lot of different options to maybe start online classes in the fall and join us physically on campus in the spring, um, maybe start the following year. Um, so again, really important to ask those questions. And even if you're just starting the process, see what different institutions are doing um, because maybe you don't really like what they're doing. Maybe that's not a place you want to study. Um, so definitely start keeping an eye out because this is very unique and different um, that none of us have experienced before. So it's interesting to see what each school um, is doing, especially for our international student um, population. But I will open it up um, to some questions. Um, that is part of our, a photo of our campus there at Merrimack. Um, overlooking our, our football field, nice sunset. Um, looks a lot like campus right now, since unfortunately we don't have our students on campus, but we are looking forward to having them come back. But um, yeah, let us know what questions that you have. So I have one question to you. Uh, do you think it is highly probable that the universities in the United States are going to cancel SATs this year? That's a great question. So I, it's definitely is different from university to university. Um, I was speaking on a panel last night with many different universities. Um, some do require the SAT and the ACT. And as of right now, some of those institutions are still requiring it. For us at Merrimack, we are test optional other than for our nursing program. So we do not require the SAT or the ACT. Um, we do require English proficiency exams. So sometimes students will take the SAT or the ACT for that. Um, but I know, especially in your countries, there might not be a lot of options to take it. So we also are offering the Duolingo English test. Um, but again, Things are changing every single day um, here in the US and colleges are changing what they're doing for um, the next application cycle. So definitely keep checking throughout the summer because I really think a lot of colleges will be going um, test optional, a lot already have. And I think as things continue to change, um, policies will also change for some universities as well. Great question. Yeah, thank you very much. No problem. Does anyone else have a question? Uh, for those who have questions, if you want to 
either you can take it for now or write it in the, the chat box um, as you wish. I have a question. Oh, oh go ahead. Go ahead, Jana. Okay, thank you. So um, under the specialized academic programs, I saw that there is an interdisciplinary programs and uh, there's no link that can uh, that I can learn something from. So can you explain explain something more about that, please? Yeah. Gail, do you want to explain that or? Sure. The interdisciplinary program. Um, so basically, if you had wanted to piece together different things. Let's say you wanted to go into the music business, but you didn't want to be a business major and you didn't just want to be music. We can create, you would work with in conjunction with faculty to create a major that would fit you. So if interdisciplinary means you're crossing disciplines. So you're crossing the discipline of business as well as going into music. And then they can make requirements of here's this number of music classes and here's the number of business. Like right now I have a student who wants to be um, an architectural designer. So we have a creating a hybrid major that combines graphic design with engineering. And we're putting that together so that when she goes on for her graduate work, that she will be prepared to actually become an architectural engineer or yes, <laughs> designer that is. Does that help? Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. And I'll help you with that process. I wouldn't just be like, good luck with that. I'll help you. <laughs> I have a question about the internships. Um, mm -hmm. I think it sounds very interesting that you're able to do an internship while you're exploring. And I'm just wondering if you have maybe some examples of what internships previous students have done while they were exploring. Sure. Well, I, I it was actually just recently I had a graphic design student and um, she did uh, really thought 100 percent that this is what she wanted to do. And she worked within a company. One of the things I tr try to encourage her to do is also understand that that is just that company. But they had her sitting down doing just a lot of busy work. And that's not always the case. So First, she looked at it as like, that's not what I wanted to do. But then she did a different graphic design internship. And it was one that was more hands on that gave her the skill set. So what we want to do is when we're picking internships, we want to make sure we have an understanding of what you're looking to have as an experience so that we match up an internship that can offer that kind of experience to you so that we don't waste your time. Um, so now she does want to be a graphic design major. So it was an interesting process because it was uh, two. Um, I had another student who did an internship with a wedding company. Um, and um, and then she wants to be an event coordinator. So now she wants to organize all these different things. So we're looking at communications and media because communications and media offer um, being able to video photography as well as advertising and then hybriding it with marketing and entrepreneurship because she wants to open up her own business. So those are the things that I'm always strategically, when you express your interests, I'm looking at, the wide scope of like what can filter in what do you need in order to be successful and then we start talking with the career center of those internships that are available that will offer you those skill sets that are outside of what you can just learn in the classroom does that help definitely thank you so much you're welcome yeah and i think it's important to note too even if maybe you don't have an internship can't find an internship colleges and universities aren't just a place to study. It's really becomes a second home for a lot of students and there's so many options and opportunities to get involved with clubs and organizations. Maybe you want to be part of student government and you can actually be part of the event planning committee there, planning large scale events. So you're still getting very similar skills that you would be getting at, you know, the wedding um, planning internship, um, but you know, it's on campus focused on supporting the students available. I know that we also just at Merrimack just kind of revamped um, and improved um, the TV studio space on campus. There's a radio station. So if you're interested in exploring those options and opportunities, you can also do it um, without um, doing an internship as well. 
Um, and that's stuff you can always put on your resume or your CV um, because you're still gaining a skill set from it as well. But it definitely always helps to have those internships and know that that is an option available. And I want to tag on to that, even our athletics, we've gone to Vision One. So that is the top level that you can do in sports. And so there's something, let's say you want to be involved with sports. There's sports casting, there's uh, writing, there's um, operations of teams, operation management. All of these different things can be available even just on campus and being involved in that as well. Lots of stuff. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from students? Um, yes, I have one more question. Um, so I kind of missed the part when you explained about the two-year planning program. So is there, uh, so those two years, all the students have the same subjects and after those two years, we are deciding upon our majors or I did it wrong? I mean, I okay. understand it wrong. Yeah, yeah, no problem. It doesn't have to be two years, the two years. So there's two years of general education requirements. So there's courses in English, philosophy, history. Um, I'm guessing your foreign language will be waived since we're having that. Um, but you know, we have sciences um, and so forth, social sciences. All of those are required of everybody. Now, there's multiple classes that fulfill those requirements. So it's not exactly the exact class you know, except for the English. But for most of them, they have different classes that will fulfill those requirements. Now, the rule is by the end of your sophomore year, so by the end of your second year, you need to declare your major. So we have those two years to explore, but you don't have to take those two years. For example, I had freshmen come in as undecided and have now just recently decided on what they want to major in. That's only after their first year. They can still fulfill their general education all the way up until their senior year, but now they can start taking their major classes and filtering it in with those gen eds. So either we can take all the gen eds first in the first two years, or as you start to figure it out, and we try and double dip those gen eds to try and fulfill what majors that interest you. For example, let's say psychology interests you. I know that psychology fulfills a social science. So, we would do that. Or let's say business interests you. I know economics fulfills the social science and it's a business requirement. I would have you take economics just so that you can start to explore what it looks like to be in these majors. And the more and more you start to figure out what you want, the more and more we'll dive a little bit deeper. But it's not restricted on you taking all gen eds first and then major, it can be mixed up. Does that make sense? Um, yes, now it's clear. And okay. um, so regarding the fact that I'm uh, in uh, IB diploma student, uh, wow. so I wanted to know whether uh, if I decide the later, let's say in the first year, uh, upon a major that is connected with the subject that I have already studied uh, during the IB program. Uh, do I receive any credits or something like that? Like, uh, because I know that some schools do it, but for the AP, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the IB. I'll give yeah. that to Kelly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it kind of depends on where you land um, with the IB, um, with the scores, what kind of area. So we're actually starting to really build that out and have that um, more upfront on the website. Like you said, sometimes it's easier to see exactly if you get a four or a five on the AP exam, you'll get credit. Um, but sometimes with the IB, it's a little murkier. Um, so we're going to be building that out this summer a little bit more clearly on our website. Um, I have a, just a quick question uh, about the application. When I apply for an undergraduate program, do I apply to a specific school? So for example, to School of Education and Social Policy, or do I make my application just very general and after choosing a major, I'm assigned to, assigned to a specific school? How does that work? Yeah, so that's really great. Um, and again, it differs from school to school. So if you're looking at, you know, some of the really large state schools, like, for example, like a University of Michigan, you likely would have to say, I want to go to University of Michigan and I want to study in their school of education or social policy 
on your application. Um, a school like Merrimack, um, you know, we're, while we definitely have schools within the college, um, like Gail was saying, we have five different schools, um, that's not something that you would have to indicate um, on your application. You can indicate that you're interested in studying education or you're interested in studying business um, as one of the majors that you can select for Merrimack, um, but you don't necessarily have to say, I want to study at the Girard School of Business at Merrimack. You can just say that you're interested in being a business administration major. Um, so every single school on the Common App is a little different if you use um, the Common Application. All right, so supposedly, uh, for example, I start studying at Merrimack and I'm interested in business. And so if I go undeclared at first, so where do I study? just on Merrimack or how does that work? Like what's the status? Yep, yeah, so even if you're studying within our, you know, School of Liberal Arts or the School of Business, you'll always still be a student at, um, at Merrimack. So okay. if you do come in um, undeclared liberal arts, at first you'll be within our School of Liberal Arts because that's where our Discover program and our undeclared students um, are housed. Um, but once you decide to um, study business, um, you'll move over to our Girard School of Business. Um, kind of as Gail mentioned, I mentioned earlier, we're very lucky at Merrimack where students have the opportunity and flexibility to move around schools. Um, but again, definitely um, great questions to ask um, your admission counselor um, at the schools you're interested in ask is it difficult to switch from the school of liberal arts to the school of business um, because for some like us it isn't that difficult um, for others they might be giving you different advice saying you know what our school of business is very competitive it's very hard to get into if you aren't admitted to the school of business um, from the start um, so i wish there was an answer um, that goes for every single university and college um, but for Merrimack, it's easy to move around. Okay, actually, flexibility is great. So yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, no, no problem. I agree. I also, like Gail, um, was came in when I went to university um, undeclared. I had no idea um, what I wanted to do. So I know that was something when I was looking at colleges, going through the search, that I wanted to make sure I had that flexibility because I was changing my mind every single day. <laughs> so I also have additional question uh, mm -hmm. to you and to all like universities. So how does the counting, like how do you count our English abilities? Because for example, as I'm from Poland or someone is from Georgia, we don't have Polish or we don't have English as our first language. And mm -hmm. for example, uh, people from United Kingdom have. So how do you count it? Do you take it, this into account or do we have to be counted the same as people from, exa for example, from United Kingdom? Yeah, absolutely. So usually as we look through um, the application process, and it depends on what type of um, school you studied at, was the instruction all in English, um, for those who have, um, you know, their first language as English, um, so those in the UK, they won't have to take, um, you know, a uh, English proficiency exam if English is their first language. Um, so for those, you know, if your first language is Polish, um, and on our website we have a very long list of exactly what scores and what um, tests we use um, to determine um, English proficiency in the application process. Um, like I mentioned, you could, you know, receive, if you're taking the SAT for a requirement for some universities, if you receive a 510 on the English language section, um, that would be enough for you to be determined as English proficient at Merrimack. Um, we are also offering the Duolingo English test. Um, that's kind of newer. We've been offering it this past year. You'll see a lot of universities for English proficiency now start to offer the Duolingo English test. Really fantastic. Um, you can take it in the comfort of your home. Um, whenever you want. Um, and we actually will get the results within about two days. So it's very quick. Um, and we just require a minimum of 105 for that. 
Um, so there's definitely a lot of different options um, and opportunities um, for students to demonstrate English proficiency. Again, what the minimum score is will be different from every school and what they will accept um, for English proficiency also differs. So my recommendation is if you're looking at a lot of different schools, um, see what they all are looking for. Um, and as you know, these exams can be a little pricey. They add up quickly. Um, so if you can just take the dual English test score and every single school that you're applying to accepts it, it'd be great for you just to take that one exam and send that score um, to all of them. So definitely do some research um, on that and also reach out. Sometimes schools might have some free test codes um, if that's also a concern. They might not be able to, but always definitely worth the ask. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. I have one more question. Yeah. Um, uh, so, do you provide a full scholarship for international students, uh, taking into account the fact that, for example, my country, North Macedonia, uh, mm -hmm. is not a, like a um, high income high income country so mm -hmm. uh, there is no way let's say to um, to afford the full tuition fee for me to study in Merrimack yeah that's a great question so unfortunately at Merrimack we do not offer or we don't have um, full tuition uh, merit scholarships for international students um, all of our international students are considered for our merit scholarship. Um, this year, they averaged anywhere between about $8,000 a year to about twenty-two dollars to $23,000 a year, which is definitely a nice um, amount of money. Um, but if you were to come to Merrimack this year um, for a room and board, um, tuition, fees, um, to get health insurance as an international student, our estimated cost this year was about $63,653. Um, I always recommend um, to students uh, in the U.S. and internationally, um, we do have a free application at Merrimack. So it does not cost any money to apply to Merrimack um, to see how much um, scholarship you can receive, um, but in order for us to issue um, kind of I-20 paperwork for you to bring it to um, your embassy in order to get a F-1 visa, um, we are required by the U.S. government um, to have you show that between scholarship and personal funds or maybe funds from government outside scholarship that you're able to um, have enough um, funding available to attend um, the estimated cost of Merrimack. So you would have had to have shown the $63,653 this year. If that answers your question. Yes, thanks. Yeah. But I also, oh, and I misspelled um, my email. Um, it's Garland and then the letter K, <laughs> like for Kelly, at merrimack.edu. Um, so if you do have any questions, it's always those typos. They always just auto-correct back to Garland. <laughs> well, you got um, mine right. Thank you. <laughs> I, yeah, I got yours right, Gail. <laughs> so yeah, if you just add the letter K um, after Garland before the at sign, um, you can also email international at merrimack.edu as well. Um, if you do have any questions, it'll still get sent to me since I would be your admission counselor or your admission rep. Um, but yeah, definitely reach out. Um, we know that going through um, the application process as an international student um, can be challenging. It's a different educational system. Um, and all of us, I think, that work in international um, admission we love working with our international students um, and we wanna make it um, as easy as possible since I know sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. So definitely um, reach out with e 